podcast. My name's Adam Williams, and with me tonight is Half Man Half Mixing Deck producer Andrew Glassford and Green New Deal member and Emeritus Professor Peter Somerville. Climate activism comes in many different forms, but what should connect them all is the belief that each action is done with at least the hope of bringing some form of change, whether today or at some point in the future. But effective activism is often extremely hard to conceive. What was shocking yesterday is mainstream today, and without a revolution, it is only a matter of time before our revolutionary heroes are sucked into the capitalist machine and spat out as key rings and t-shirts. In addition to this, climate activism is up against a relentless clock that increases the need for a more radical approach year after year, as humanity continues to consume ever-increasing amounts of fossil fuels. Up until this point, environmental groups have by and large embraced tactics of non-violent protests and mild disruptions based on the belief that these were the most effective tactics of the major civil rights and justice campaigns of the past. But is this really true? Tonight's guest is Andreas Malm, an Associate Senior Lecturer of Human Ecology at Lund University, whose most recently released book is provocatively entitled How to Blow Up a Pipeline, a title which may give some indication of the direction that he thinks the climate movement should perhaps now be thinking of heading. Andreas, a warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Adam. It's a pleasure. Okay, so Andreas, uh, we did actually try and get you on the show quite a while ago, but for one, for one reason or another, it never happened, which meant that I actually managed to read an extra book of yours. Um, so in addition to How to Rope a Pipeline, I also read Corona Climate, Chronic Emergency, War Com Communism in the 21st Century. And after I read uh, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, I remember turning to my missus and, and saying to her, this guy's going to get me arrested, you know. <laughs> and then when we had that delay and I read the second one, I, I honestly, I said, I'm telling you, this guy is going to get me arrested. <laughs> so so the, my first question is quite a simple one, mate. Will you come and visit me in prison? <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but yeah. similarly, like I, I was read, reading this, reading the book this week, and um, I could f genuinely felt myself getting radicalized in in bed re reading it, going like, "This all makes loads of sense." <laughs> gonna... <laughs> it does that to you, doesn't it? It radicalizes yeah. you on the spot. Yeah. Um, I, so I have, I, I, I have to say, I have a similar feeling right now when I'm reading Kim Stanley Robinson's most recent novel, The, the Ministry for the Future. Have you read it? Anyone of you? No, I haven't. No, Peter, you're the big reader. No, I've not read that one. No. Uh, yeah, no. it, it's it really is a, a must read for uh, for all of us in the climate movement or, or anyone who is interested in it. I think it's the best mm. climate fiction novel that I've read so far, and uh, it's one one of the coolest uh, radical books on on climate that, that I've yeah that I've ever, ever come across. Brilliant! And it it has it, it has as part of its plot uh, groups. Uh, conducting even more radical kinds of activism than anything that I uh, envision in my book. So I'm, I'm thinking that this, this novel is radicalizing me too. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we'll certainly have a read of that one. Okay, so the title of, of your last book was How to Blow Up a Pipeline. That title was perhaps chosen to get people's attention, but I do want to let the audience know that it really is a, a you come from a, a place of deep analysis and also from your experiences of being on the front lines of climate activism. But for those that don't know your work, Andreas, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? But also, crucially, when did you start thinking about the climate movement perhaps needing to become more militant in its actions? Yeah, as you said, I'm an academic by profession. I work at Lund University in southern Sweden. I've done mostly historical research related to the climate issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to spend time talking about my various research projects, but um, as for my climate activism, I was primarily an activist and organizer in the sense that I was part of the direct action groups and broader climate um, organizations and initiatives in Sweden, the country where I live, uh, during the years 2006 to 2009, I would say. And I was I was active in uh, organizing the big demonstration in, in COP15. And at that point, I, as many others, had faith in the potentials for mass, peaceful climate demonstrations to make an impact on, on policymakers, to use that uh, bland term. We sort of, all of us, more or less, lost faith in that after COP15. 
And uh, since then, there has been a, a process of, of radicalization in the climate movement. And the, the one, the, the, the current within the movement that I have participated in mostly as an activist, not as an organizer, but as, a, as, as someone who goes to participate in actions as, as often as I can, uh, that current is the climate camp uh, movement and more particularly Ende Gelände in Germany. Uh, I think Ende Gelände in Germany really has developed a, a very powerful uh, concept for mass action targeting the lignite mines, some of the dirtiest fossil fuel uh, facilities that we have in Europe, out outmaneuvered the cops again and again and shutting down the, the infrastructure in and around the lignite coal mines one or several times per year. From my experience, uh, and my experience is exclusively limited to climate activism in Europe, in, in Northern Europe. But from my experience, this has been, this is the most promising concept that we've had, I think. Uh, and, and I would like to see it proliferate massively and, and, and become amplified and spread. And right now, of course, the, the, the great tragedy is that our, our entire movement is in a paralysis because of the pandemic. But when, when things can kick off again, I hope the climate camps spread and swell. But I also think that it, it, it might, there might be reason to go beyond what Ende Gelände and other climate camps have done uh, and diversify our tactics into forms of property destruction and sabotage. Much like the, <laughs> the, the Black Lives Matter movement has, has uh, contained a diversity of tactics. We can talk more about that, that parallel later. But uh, in response to your question, when have I felt an, a greater need for radical action? Well. This has been a, 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 a gradual process, not, not a specific date that, that made me feel we need to do something more. But the summer of 2018, which we all remember, was so extreme. And until Greta Thunberg started her Fridays for Future movement, there was a, a void, a vacuum, an absence of activism corresponding to uh, how extreme the situation felt. And in that very moment, uh, I mean, that, that was actually the, the moment when I s felt that I need to write something about this. And it was out of that moment that this book emerged. Uh, but, but thankfully, things changed quite dramatically after the summer of 2018, precisely thanks to Greta Thunberg, but also to Extinction Rebellion. And yeah. we saw in 2019, uh, the climate movement reach uh, uh, a, a scale of mass influence that it never had before in, in, in Europe. Uh, so, so that was that was hopeful. So your books have been quite a, a revelation to me personally. And the reason is, uh, prior to becoming what I call climate conscious, which was about a decade ago, all I really read and even studied, and I've got sort of education in, in, in sort of like revolutionary politics. Um, but about a decade ago, it really dawned on me that the climate crisis is bigger than all that. And so I kind of spent the, the, the years after that really trying to get to grips with with climate change and putting that revolutionary stuff to one side while I, while I sort of learned this stuff. Mm. And But reading your work has really synthesised those two things together and it's got me reading, again, um, some revolutionary stuff. So I picked up an Antonio Gramsci biography just the other week, first time I've read any revolutionary stuff for ages. Um, so, but that being said, putting two things that you love together in many ways, you know, it is, is, is intellectually sound. A lot of new ideas can come from that. But it's, it's very rare that it's the answer to, to something, you know, uh, or the whole answer to something. So in regard to sort of like, I'm thinking more like confirmation bias. Was there any, did you, did you recognise it bringing your two loves together? Yeah, there might be some confirmation bias there. And if so, what, what was ways that you sort of mitigated that? Sure. Yeah, I got a similar question from a Swedish journalist uh, and Swedish journalists remember my own kind of left activism before I focused ex almost exclusively on climate. And, and the journalist asked me, are you a revolutionary uh, searching for your opportunity to make a revolution, something like that? And then you, uh, you know, you, you attach yourself to the climate issue because that seems like a promising venue for revolution. And this is... Uh, of course, uh, a, a quite common right-wing uh, uh, analysis of why the left banks on about climate. It's just an, another excuse to impose socialism on people and these things. Now, now, that, now this, this journalist was, wasn't, I should say, a, a right-wing journalist by any means to the, to the contrary. But I, my answer to the, that was, well, yes, it's not by coincidence that people 
who are on the radical left have a greater ability to absorb the, the reality of the climate crisis fully because that reality has so damning implications for the status quo that if you are if you're if you're not in love with revolution but you're in love with status quo you will have an extremely hard time to take on board climate science and the the unvarnished reality of climate breakdown you will if you love status quo you will find ways to either deny the existence of the crisis or downplay it or distort it or belittle it or believe that we can uh, tinker a little bit with some systems here and there but but we're, we're going to solve it something like bill gates is apparently arguing in his in his new book but what the i mean what the science is so clear about is that this is a crisis of a magnitude uh, that it's it's really it's it's hard to to fully get a grip on it but as you say when you when when your eyes are open to the extent and depth of this crisis it's hard to let go of it and to think of of much else, but the people who are capable of doing this are primarily people on the left. And polls continue to show this again and again and again, or all over the world, that humanity is divided into left and right, in that people on the left are much more prone to, to accept the reality of the climate crisis and, and feel great concerns about it, whereas people on the right are much more uh, inclined to, to deny or downplay it. And, so, and, and that's logical. So uh, being a revolutionary predisposes one to, uh, to some extent, at least, take on the, the climate question. That, that's not to say that all revolutionaries or all people on the left uh, care a lot about climate, because there are still people on the left who, who uh, believe that, that climate and ecology uh, aren't really cool things. And they're, they're, it's, 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 I mean, you can still find the uh, the the old prejudice that it's a kind of petty bourgeois hobby or something like that. Yeah, or just yeah. Marxists and other revolutionaries who just simply don't care and who remain completely indifferent and continue to harp on their old themes that they've always uh, yeah. harped. Do you know? Do you know what, Andreas? I agree with that because what I think is that a true revolutionary is someone who who sort of changes depending on what information, new information comes about. And I often think that some of the old sort of socialists and some of the old revolutionaries, the more the more in love with the symbolism of that style of revolution rather than revolution itself. So when something comes along like climate change, yeah. a real revolution should really bend to its will and absorb it and change with it where, rather than saying, oh, no, it's really this and I'm going to ignore that. And I think that's, you know, I think that really is sort of a dividing path and a lot of people stay in them old ways. I kind of wanted to kind of go back through some of the history in, in the book a little bit. You kind of discuss how several like large i guess civil rights movements had like kind of violent flanks or wings involved in them so with the suffragettes you know they were smashing windows and cutting up paintings in art galleries and bombing places and stuff and then you know similar with um the black panthers involved in the civil rights movement in the u.s and there's kind of like i would dub like a peace washing of these movements after the fact of like, oh yeah, we all remember why Sylvia Pankhurst was great because she really championed women's rights as opposed to the strategic and tactical elements that they use to get to the point they need to do. Do you think there's like a mechanism for this kind of peace washing? Is there a certain reason why it happens? Or is it just, I don't know, is it just because the status quo has moved, everyone's just, they're moving on so they don't think about the bad bits of it? <laughs> That's a wonderful term, peace washing. I haven't heard it before. Did you coin it, or, or? I think I did just now. Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let, let's let let's let's use that term. I think part of the the psychological attraction of peace washing is the feeling that we can accomplish great things by being by being nice people, mm. by not having to uh, engage in serious and potentially quite risky forms of 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 uh, antagonism and and hostility hostility and yeah. uh, you know fighting with people it feels it feels better for a lot of people to think that you could abolish slavery and uh, get women the right to vote and uh, free colonies by just being peaceful mm. so we can we can we can continue to be peaceful now 
it, it, the, the sad thing about that is, is that it isn't true because these histories really, as you say, have been peace washed in the sense that they've been sanitized and the what, what actually happened in, in the episodes there are so frequently invoked was something completely different. Mm. And you don't need to go to go back in, into the the history of, of decades or even centuries ago. Um, I, I'd like to come back here briefly just to, to the analogy of uh, BLM that I mentioned. Mm. Uh, and, and the climate movement could look at what happened in, in 2020 in the US after the murder of George Floyd. You had people in, in the Minneapolis storming the, the police station in the third precinct and uh, burning it to the ground. And uh, not only did polls show that there was a majority support for that action in the US at that time, but this action wow. served as a catalyst for the movement for Black, Black Lives to leap onto a mass scale that it had never attained before and attract tens of millions of people. And on some counts, becoming the largest social movement in US history. If you count the number of people who participated in demonstrations, most of them, of course, peaceful. I mean, the, the overwhelming majority of all the actions in the, in the wave after the murder of George Floyd were peaceful, but there was always a component of militant confrontation with the police from the mm -hmm. very beginning and of property destruction, as in destroying police property, uh, uh, police stations, police cars, also things like toppling statues of old uh, racist slave yeah. owner confederacy generals and, and the, these things and i i think that it, it would be hard to argue that the climate sorry that that the movement for black lives would have achieved more if it had stayed exclusively with a completely peaceful gentle timid civil disobedience that the climate movement has stuck to uh, right. So I think the climate movement need, needs to learn from their from various episodes in history, but it could start by learning from what happened in 2020 in the US. Yeah, Andreas, I sometimes think that, I think perhaps one of the reasons why they've kind of devalued or ignored the more radical aspects of these movements, and when I, when I say they, I mean the climate movement as a whole, yeah. is because, especially in England, it's very sort of, it's very, it's very much a middle class movement yeah. um, and a very much a, of a certain age movement. Yeah. And um, I, I'm not sure if it's if it's part of their social makeup really to really embrace those more radical aspects. And I think if you've not got it in your movement, it's very easy to kind of devalue or dismiss the importance of an aspect that you just do not have. I think you're spot on there. I think I think that's absolutely true. And I think that this is. Uh... If you look at two other social movements that have really shaken up things in the global north in recent years, the Yellow Vests in France and BLM in the US, they have had other class bases uh, and obviously uh, another, another kind of racial base as well. Uh, both of them have been uh, predominantly working class movements uh, and with the BLM obviously uh, predominantly a black movement. Whereas the climate movement in the UK and the US and much of Europe and Sweden <laughs> included for sure is primarily a white middle class movement still. Primarily, I should say. Lots of good exceptions, but, but predominantly. And that makes for a certain kind of uh, uh, politics of respectability and comfort, uh, a reluctance to engage in confrontational tactics. But this, this, this is not exclusively a matter of, of, of demography, I think, but it's also about our historical moment where we have, I mean, social movements and the left have unlearned uh, how to fight uh, in, in lots of respects and forgotten uh, or cut our ties to a very long history and legacy of a popular struggle that has included much more militant tactics. So if the, if the climate movement would have, uh, I mean, if the climate issue would have blown up in the 1960s or 70s or even the early 80s, I think, uh, uh, for instance, uh, an, a UK climate movement would have looked quite differently because at that time there was still a living memory uh, and or, yeah, I mean, uh, a contemporary reality that people struggled uh, in a militant fashion around the world for, for their rights. And sure, yeah. That's not the situation any longer in, in the same. So my questions really um, follow on from Quite a lot of the things that you've been saying, and they, they certainly relate to, her, and I think you've kind of partly answered them. My questions are um, really relating to this issue of um, violence against property, and and when you think that's justified, when it isn't. 
you seem to you seem to you're accepting Will Smith's kind of three criteria for saying when it's it's okay to to have violent action against property and avoiding serious harm to people, failing of the gentler tactics have failed, and some higher charter agreement has been breached. Um, but I think it's, is there not another criterion that's really important here, which you've just touched on some things you're saying just now, that, that you have to have strong grounds for believing that the violence is necessary to advance a just cause, acting as a radical flank, that sort of thing, uh, and not retarding it by alienating support. So it's a very fine balance there. Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. That that should probably be the central criterion. And um, it's it's a question that anyone who considers this kind of tactic as, as part of the repertoire for the climate movement must ask themselves, uh, would an action of the, of the kind that we're pondering do more harm or more good to the movement and the cause? And it's, it's, it's not difficult to envision forms of property destruction that could be predominantly harmful for the movement. If you go after forms of, for instance, commodities or consumption goods with no obvious connection to the climate crisis in people's eyes and that are consumed by very ordinary kinds of people, then you probably piss people off rather than, uh, than rallying them to, to the cause. Without, without being uh, judgmental to, to people in France, I'd just like to mention a, an example. There was a, a briefly a network that uh, announced itself in France last year a few months after this book uh, came out in, in French and actually came out in, in, in France uh, long before it came out in, in English, uh, calling itself La Ronce, or which means bramble. And they, um, they call for actions targeting SUVs along the lines uh, that I sketch in the book and uh, total gas stations, but also they encourage people to go into supermarkets and um, open Coca-Cola bottles so that the, the they would fizzle, I mean, the, the, yeah, the gas would fizzle out and the, these would be rendered useless. And that, that kind of, that, that's, a, that's a kind of action that I f- really don't think would be very effective because uh, people, people who buy Coca-Cola bottles in, in, in supermarkets are probably quite ordinary working class people. Uh, and uh, when they when they when they see bottles, uh, you know, sabotage or destroyed in a, in a supermarket shelf, shelf that that probably doesn't strike people as an obvious, clearly conceived, intelligent uh, uh, targeting of uh, uh, something that drives the climate crisis. And and in in a flippant sense, they're just releasing more CO two into the atmosphere as well. Yeah, you know, those <laughs> sodas. So yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe so. Yes, uh, <laughs> every balance here is is very uh, fine and precarious. But I'm trying to to impress on on readers of this book that if you're uh, considering, like I do, uh, the need to escalate into these forms of tactics, you need to be careful and and very selective in what you're targeting. Uh, and you, you, you should be able to explain to people why you're doing what you're doing and why it is right to do it. And if you're unable to explain things and, and gain some kind of mass support for it, you, you should abstain. And connected to that, Andreas, when you ask in Pipeline, you know, at what point do we escalate? You also make it clear that, you know, actions, even escalated actions, are not going to be enough to create the substantive change that we need all actions need to be based on the hope or some form of tactic that shakes the government out of its business as usual mindset. Because as you say in the books, it's only the state mechanisms that can really be effective against the fight against climate breakdown. So can you just say a little bit more about you know the, 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 the connection between activism and the state? This is uh, a fraught and complicated issue, but We've seen recently in a number of cases on smaller scales that the climate movement can actually compel or almost force states into taking small steps in the right direction. But I stress these have been small steps. 
But uh, to take the case of Emre Gelende and uh, the struggle against the lignite mines in Germany, this struggle actually uh, made the German state set up a commission to discuss when lignite mining should be completely phased out and terminated in Germany. That was thanks to the pressure from Ende Gelende and the climate movement that such a commission was even uh, set up. Unfortunately, the balance of forces was so detrimental to us that the decision this commission came up with was 2038. So we'll be going uh, with the lignite mines for another two decades, another two decades of, of digging up and burning the dirtiest fossil fuel of all which is completely unacceptable. And therefore, Ende Gelende is continuing and the struggle continues. And we have to try to shift the balance of forces by growing the moment by a, an order of magnitude or something, and, and possibly including more radical kinds of tactics to make a coming commission go for immediate, in, direct phase out. Another example is that the, the Denmark uh, has a social democratic government, which is lousy and awful in, in most respects particularly on, on migration, but which recently made the decision to uh, cancel all licensing of new oil and gas fields in the North Sea. And Denmark is now the largest remaining oil and gas producer in, uh, in the European Union. And this was, again, uh, a result of the climate mobilizations that happened, happened in Denmark and that were quite significant in 2019 and that were part of the shift in, in popular support that brought this government into power. So it, we have seen examples of this kind of, I could take others from, from Sweden and from the US uh, 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 pre-Trump, where, where the state can respond to pressure from the climate movement. It, it's just that these steps have been very tiny, very, very tiny so far, uh, but it, it, I think they at least demonstrate the potential for this kind of mechanism to uh, to work, it, it, we we just have to be much more, much stronger, much more powerful for yeah. it to work better. Yeah, hundred percent. And also, it's a stark contrast between not every action will be successful, but the ones that were trying to shut down coal mines to put pressure on the government is vastly more sophisticated than people opening coke bottles and chucking them around in Tesco. And it's like our actions have to be, you know, at their core. Um, purposed towards state action. I was really thinking about things in your book and also things you've been saying now about um, what are the, what more action we need to take. I mean, that Adam raised in relation to the state, obviously put more pressure on governments to act and that can have set that kind of some effect. But the really, uh, I'm thinking about what are the strategies, what strategies have you got or you can think of that, that can advance that? So we're all part of this Green New Deal uh, Labour for Green New Deal thing, which so we have our own kind of idea of what a strategy would be. So I was interested in knowing what what kind of strategies uh, you might have in mind. I'm all for the uh, GND project and uh, Labour for for GND and uh, and all these things. And uh, I'm a little bit. Uh, uh, sad to say that some readers, more, perhaps more particularly of the, the book that I wrote on Corona, interpreted it as proposing an alternative to the Green New Deal, as something, something, uh, something else, as a, as a, as an implicit rejection of that project, and per perhaps some <laughs> would also read the book or the Pipeline book as. as Oh, this guy doesn't believe in the Green New Deal. He, he wants to see sabotage instead. But that's not my purpose. Uh, yeah, I had another I had a conversation with a with a comrade in the U.S. about these things, and he said parts of the climate movement in the U.S. have really banked on the GND, or or something approximating the the GND uh, under a Biden administration, and a, a, there might be a risk that if you have an escalation in tactics from the climate movement you might mm, harm the GND project. And, and my response to that would be, well, if you are in a political situation where the GND has real momentum uh, and it uh, looks like it's about to be implemented, uh, that would not be the, the time to perhaps to, to engage in very spectacular uh, property destruction that, that might disrupt uh, such a political process. Although you, you could also, of course, envision uh, it working hand in hand with such a process. 
but but yeah, you, uh, there there might be situations where more militant forms of action could be conducive to bringing a green new deal onto the agenda or uh, uh, driving home the need for a very swift transition. And more particularly, what I have in mind here uh, uh, is the inevitable situation that we'll face again and again in the years ahead. Uh, or when real climate uh, disasters strike in our countries. I mean, the UK will certainly see more uh, instances of extreme flooding or uh, extremely hot summers with droughts uh, and, and things like that, uh, or new, new uh, unprecedented storms. And in those moments, uh, I mean, so far, the way that we've, we've dealt with those moments uh, are by, by, by adaptation, by, by evacuation, by trying to, you know, cope with, uh, with the water or the, the, the lack of it or, or the, yeah, the heat stress or whatever it is. And the climate movement still hasn't learned to strike when the iron is hot and uh, 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 launch direct actions at the moment of climate disaster. But that, that I think will be a key uh, strategic uh, orientation in the near future for the movement to prepare for those moments and be ready to strike in a radical way and uh, thereby uh, show to the public and to the government that unless you deal very aggressively with, this, with the sources, the drivers of these disasters, we will just have more and more and more of them. So, for instance, uh, one, one, ex one you know, counterfactual example that I have had in mind for some time is if some people during the Australian wildfire inferno that, that uh, you know, struck Australia a little more than a year ago, if some climate activists, while the fires were raging, would have gone into a coal mine or some other coal facility in Australia, and Australia is, I think, still the world's largest coal exporter, and uh, the, the government there is just uh, continuing to let that industry expand. If some activists had gone in and, and somehow destroyed, taken apart uh, or uh, blown up or whatever, part of the, that infrastructure and, and said to people that, hey, look, unless we stop with this coal production and combustion, we are yeah. going to see more and more and more of those wildfires. Here is the reason why we are having those wildfires. And yeah. this reason has to be taken offline. And if states uh, uh, can't do it, we'll have to show them how it's done and try to, to push states to do what's necessary. I think that that would have resonated with a, a, a reasonable part of the Australian population. Although obviously you'd had, you would have resistance from the far right in Australia as you will have everywhere. Mm. But I think uh, when we, the, the climate movement needs to, to move away from the kind of mechanical calendar of we're going to have actions on certain Fridays or certain, certain days of action yeah. or, or dates that, that are uh, join, conjoined to, to summits or something like that. And, and learn to politicize the moments of climate disaster because that's when people see what this, uh, this trend is, is bringing into our lives. I was, I was gonna say actually that like Australia is quite an interesting one for me. I used to live in Australia sure. um, and when I lived there, I'm sure there was only about 23 million people in the whole country so it's still not a hell of a lot of people to be to be engaged in order to create some real change whereas somewhere like america is 370 million people you know so so strategically australia could be quite um quite a, a, a good place to where this could possibly start you know the fight back could possibly start but i just wanted to ask um when you in corona and climate um, you write that social democracy had a real chance, as you put it, when the two classic citadels of the capitalist core, namely Britain and US, could have voted for Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, but obviously that never happened. And then you've written, the time for gradualism is now over. We, as Labour members, we were really hit hard when Jeremy Corbyn didn't get in. Um, this podcast is really stems from those times uh, through Labour for a Green New Deal and that space that was created where anything seemed possible. It seems to me that you maybe had a, a similar feeling that that was potentially the last throw of the dice. Was, was that something for you where Bernie never got the nomination for the Democratic Party, Jeremy Corbyn got trounced? Did that feel like the end for you and now is the time for a new way of acting in the climate movement? 
Well, yes and no. Uh, le let me just say that when I read the Labour manifesto for the election in uh, 2019, in, in autumn of 2019, I was just taken aback. I mean, I, I felt I have never seen a major party in an advanced capitalist country putting forward uh, a program so, uh, so incredibly good yeah, yeah saying all the right things <laughs> yeah. you know making all the right connections between class struggle and climate struggle and putting yeah. it front and center this is exactly what we've been dreaming of uh, or, uh, you know those of us who are on the left and who have been in the climate movement for years so i was uh, not on cloud nine but i was extremely excited about it and i was actually in a debate with the vice uh, uh, prime minister in sweden from the greens also the, the Minister of the Environment, uh, I think two weeks before the election. And I try to trounce her with the, with the, with the, with the, the Labour manifesto and say, look, this is this and this and this is what you need to do. And we're going to, uh, when, when, when our comrades win in the, in the UK, this is what we're going to do. And you, you, you who are lousy, useless Greens, Liberal Greens <laughs> and the Swedish government will be put to shame. And that was a, a, a debate with a quite large audience in Stockholm. And uh, yeah, a couple of weeks later, uh, the, yeah, the, the curtain was drawn on this project and yeah, then it was nothing over. happened. Yeah. Because uh, nationalism always fucks everything up. And, and, the, and, the, and I had a similar moment in, uh, in regards to, to, to Sanders when he had won Nevada. You, I, I started to lapse into hope there as well that perhaps... <laughs> You could you could envision a scenario where where Sanders actually wins the nomination and you you would have him against Trump. Now it's not the first time in my political life that I've had a feeling that well now perhaps finally we're going to see some kind of change. I mean I had the feeling as many people did when Syriza won in Greece. Mm. I had that feeling because I, I have a background as uh, as working a lot with 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 issues in the Middle East when the Arab Spring happened. And you you get disappointed again and again and again, and the, you're almost inured to the experience. But this, uh, to me, is not reason to give up. Not even on on the Green New Deal as a political project that could potentially come about through some kind of an electoral breakthrough somewhere in the world. I mean, at some point, maybe someone like Jeremy Corbyn or Bernie Sanders can win an election. If uh, if the constellation of forces is is perfect for us, uh, it it hasn't happened yet, but that's not a reason to to believe that it can never happen. If if it's time to conclude that it's that we that that the left should give up on the Labour Party or on the Democratic Party in the U.S. and uh, revert to the idea of forming uh, f uh, other political formations to the left of those parties. That that's up for and that's up to to you to to comrades uh, that have been working <laughs> in those parties. It's not something that I really can adjudicate on, uh, and, and I'm not up to speed with the debates there. Uh, I I could see the merits in in making that conclusion, but I, I I'm I'm open to 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 other perspectives on this as well because I don't have the experiences and the and the insights to 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 kind of decide on this. Sure. But uh, uh, yeah, of course the. The fact that we lost with with Corbyn and with Sanders, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't speak in favor of parliamentary strategies. I guess uh, at this moment in time, uh, be because we're so short in time, yeah. and we, we just had those very significant losses. Uh, maybe that's that's a good reason to consider uh, other forms of extra parliamentary escalation. Yeah, because that's what I really was was getting at, that you feel that there's not enough time yeah. with the sort of climate clock ticking away right. for us to rebuild and go again in four or five yeah. years, you know. Uh, maybe that was I, I I the, the time solid. issue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, this is a question from uh, one of our regular co-hosts, Alex, who's not feeling very well today, so I'm going to take it from him instead. Yeah. Um, he says, um, you've championed ecological Leninism insofar as a strategic direction of Lenin was to turn World War One into a fatal blow against capitalism. And this is precisely the same strategic orientation we should embrace today. We must turn the environmental crisis into a crisis for fossil capital itself. How do you square the authoritarianism of Leninism with uh, policies which are altogether more invasive to everyday citizens' lives and as such will require effective engagement with the public 
and a broader social mandate, like the greening of transport and retrofit, do you see any problems with invoking and attaching an authoritarian political theorist to a climate movement which needs popular buy-in to succeed? <laughs> so a simple question for you. Just a really yeah, simple... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really simple. Well, I, I don't know if you guys want to discuss Lenin uh, in, in great depth, but uh, Lenin is a complicated figure and a complex one and multifaceted one. And I would not endorse a view of him as a, as a, a squarely an authoritarian figure mm. and a political theorist for, uh, for uh, tyranny. To the contrary, I think that he, uh, uh, being part of the very collective leadership of the Bolshevik party was absolutely instrumental in establishing popular democratic power in 1917 and elevating that power to the level of government in Russia. Now, obviously, that situation degenerated and crashed and uh, after a few years had m indeed morphed into uh, a highly authoritarian, eventually absolutely unbearable, suffocating form of totalitarian rule. Uh, but I, we, we shouldn't go into, I mean, th this is not the, the place to discuss all the details about why the Russian Revolution yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> degenerates and all of these things. Although that's a, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a hobby, you can't get enough of it once you, once you, go, you get hooked on it. But uh, the, 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 the very point with invo invoking Lenin here is not to, to argue that we have to have authoritarian tyranny absolutely not when it comes to the strategic orientation that he was so famous for in trying to transform a crisis of symptoms into a crisis of drivers so the war uh, converted into a revolutionary crisis where you uh, topple the classes that sustain the catastrophe year after year yeah. no matter how many millions die that strategic orientation is not part of the, the, the authoritarian aspects of Lenin's deed that, that you can, of course, recognize the, yeah. their, their existence. Uh, you find the same strategic orientation, as I say in the book, in, in, in Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht in the entire anti-war opposition within uh, uh, the, the remainders of the Second International Parties during the First World War. And uh, if this is the, the core of ecological Leninism, as I very crudely and roughly sketch it in that book it's it's in a sense it's it's a it's a provocative name for something that should be completely uncontroversial mm. and that is that unless we manage to shift those those crises of the of the symptoms of the cli the, the, uh, the climate breakdown into crisis for the drivers we'll only get more and more catastrophe right. uh, that i mean that's uh, almost axiomatically true it's just that it's exactly what lenin and luxembourg and Liebknecht said uh, uh, I mean, obviously not in content, but mm. in form a little more than a hundred years ago. So it's my, it's my way of making a thought that should be uh, fairly uncontroversial into something that's perhaps a, a red herring and, and thereby. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's kind of like your argument is then essentially it's the uh, strategic model of Leninism, which is yeah. the kind of interesting thing to environmentalists and eco-socialists as opposed to the fallout of uh, the authoritarianism which happened concurrently. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, but as as I also say in the book, I mean, uh, uh, talk, talking about these these terms, I use another very provocative term or acid term, even uh, war <laughs> communism and and, yeah. and, and and ecological war communism. Uh, using these terms uh, is for me just a way of recognizing that we will need state power in the transition, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, a degree of coercive state power because some interests will have to be coerced to give up on what they want to do and that uh, with that comes a danger of authoritarian degeneration mm. and staying with with this tradition where that that i come from which is a, a kind of a, well it's a i come from the trotskyist movement from the fourth international the you know, mandel ben said uh, movement uh, that that is a way of of you know uh, say, not making the conclusion that because things eventually degenerated and become uh, became a disaster in uh, in the Soviet, we can we 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 have to give up on uh, the insight that in moments of emergency and collapse and crisis, you might need state power 
to defeat the class enemy. Yeah. yeah. Do you, do you know, just just continuing on the theme though, because I do I do think there's an interesting question in this. Now, you, in Corona and uh, and climate, you do bring up Lenin at one point after the revolution, where you know there's a passage in the book where, which is called "Nothing is being done," I believe, and he's basically Lenin seeing all the things that are going wrong. So you've got famine, you've got war, you've got all these things. And, he, and he, what Lenin observed was that everyone can see the catastrophe, yet nothing is being done. However, he did seize um, the state levers. And in a relatively short period of time, he was able to turn things around. Yeah. Now, if we take that story and, and bring it to today, there's quite a, a simple parallel with the, the climate breakdown being sort of the war, the pestilence, and, and the famine in today's narrative who's the lenin and who who would be the bolsheviks that are going to turn this thing around who which groups are you seeing that you're thinking these could potentially be the ones that get us out of this trouble yeah yeah that really is the big question and that's the <laughs> one that i can't give a good answer to because uh, and and that's the the major difference between our situation and theirs is yeah. that we don't have an organized working class that is even remotely uh, considering uh, seizing the state or something like that. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, in a, we're in a different political universe and it's uh, very difficult to see that kind of revolutionary subject all of a sudden miraculously appearing within the next couple of years um to to take on a task similar to the, the one that the bolsheviks took on uh, <clears throat> but saying this is also to remaining open for uh, all eventualities and possibilities and uh, with a deepening climate breakdown we we'll, i think we'll see more political volatility mm -hmm we'll see more uh, initiatives from the left and from the right, uh, the far left and the far right, more commotion, more turbulence in our political orders. And we don't know what will come out of that. When societies are really shaken, uh, there can be popular initiatives emerging uh, of, of all kinds and all forms. I mean, be it mutual aid groups in, in a situation of disaster, or uh, radical uh, cater like, I don't know, climate SWAT teams or whatever. Uh, and uh, how they, uh, uh, how these groups uh, can potentially uh, evolve in relation to uh, the, the material interests to survive and, 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 and perhaps improve the lives of ordinary working people. We don't know. I mean, that's just something we can find out by, uh, through our praxis in the years ahead. Uh, but I, I don't have I don't have a response that can that that allows me to say that this uh, will be the the equivalent of the of the Kronstadt sailors and the Petrograd metal workers in the climate revolution uh, because it's very hard to 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 see who the, who these groups would be at the yeah yeah no I, I mean agree. The, the, well some have of course long uh, banked on and hoped for a sort of a climate subject to emerge from the uh, uh, the organized working class in Europe from from trade unions going for for just transition or a, a green industrial revolution or a green new deal or something like that and i mean that that's i think that's still a, a viable and valuable uh, and worthwhile political project but what we saw in 2019 was that the 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 group that came closest to being a kind of climate subject in Europe was young people. It was, I mean, age was the defining uh, factor in the movement in 2019, not, not really class or, uh, or workplace, uh, something like that, you know, position in production. And who knows? I mean, that, that might be what the climate movement will see more of in the, in the, in the coming years, that young people, and speaking strictly about Europe here, young people will be the ones who have most to lose hmm. from, from continued business totally. as usual and might uh, become more climate conscious, to use the wonderful word that, that you used, in the years ahead and, and develop into crystallized political subject than what we saw in 2019. We don't know.
And I also think as well, we need to synthesize class consciousness and climate consciousness. Maybe that's maybe that's the synthesis of the future that's really going to get us out of this. Uh, so final question from me, Andreas, and I really appreciate your time. In the end of uh, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, you have a chapter called Despair, where you kind of go into um, kind of criticizing various elites. I guess what I would describe as like indulgences when it comes to like them not wanting to do anything about climate change. You talk about Roy Scranton, who seems to have some kind of and like beautiful guilt about like him eating steaks and you know like driving SUVs and stuff. In in a previous book of yours, in the Progress of the Storm, you kind of say that the kind of history of capital is that capitalists are trying to emancipate themselves from nature. Do you think that that this is an expression of that? And if not, what is what would that look like? Yeah, that's a, an interesting thought. I haven't I haven't thought about it that way, but it might very well be. It's, uh, yeah, the, the people who espouse this kind of climate fatalism are seem to be privileged people in the global north who live very cozy, comfortable lives and feel guilty about it and feel that they're part of, of the catastrophe and can't stop themselves from being part of it and don't believe that the catastrophe can be averted or even ameliorated. So they resign themselves to the faith and argue that everyone else should do the same thing and, and learn to renounce life. And, uh, you know, it feels very Catholic to me. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Or, or, I mean, Scranton invokes Buddhism. And, Gonna say Buddhist maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some kind of distorted spirituality going on there. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know exactly. I don't, I don't know if I, if, have a ready made analysis or understanding of the psychology in this uh, but yeah it's i it's it's a pernicious phenomenon and it's it it, it has multiple manifestations i mean i saw a poll that came out some time ago that a, a, a very significant chunk if it even was a majority of young people in the us feel that there's nothing that they can do about the climate crisis and intellectuals who endorse this view by saying we should just learn to die and resign or I mean, adapt as best as we can to the inevitable collapse, uh, they are, 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 are hurting the cause and they are uh, worse, they are contributing to or confirming the paralysis. And it's precisely this paralysis that radical action has to, to break to show that this kind of infrastructure that is and the machines that are destroying this planet, they are not a biological fate. They're not mm. law bound. And uh, to again, go back to the case of BLM, when people stormed the police station in Minneapolis, I think what, what was so powerful with that action was to break the paralysis again, uh, 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 the paralysis in the face of constant police violence against black people in the US and showing people that we, the, the, the cops are not above the law. They're not beyond our influence. They, they're not our fate. We can actually go in and take over their properties if we're just determined enough. And the climate movement needs similar moments to, to show people that this is not our fate. We're not doomed to this passively and, and just have to resign to this. We can actually go in and very dramatically disrupt these machines and, and infrastructures. I think that's the Minneapolis moment that we need and, and need to create soon. Yeah, hundred percent, mate. Um, Andreas, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank um, you, Adam, Peter, and Andrew. It was wonderful to talk to you. Yeah. Now I know you've got a new book coming out. Um, I believe in March, and it's a white skin, black fuel on the danger of fossil fascism. Do you want to just give the audience a bit of a, a blurb on what that's going to be about? Yeah, that's a, an entirely different type of book. It's uh, unlike the the How to Blow Up a Pipeline. It's it's built on massive primary research conducted by. Uh, the Zetkin Collective, where uh, that I'm part of, uh, that's a group of 20 people working on the political ecologies of the far right. And we've looked uh, at 13 countries in Europe, plus the US and Brazil, and studied what the far right has said and done about climate and energy in, uh, in primarily in the past decade. One of our main findings is that still outright denial of the climate crisis and uh, aggressive uh, defense of fossil fuels and uh, promotion of their expansion. These are still the predominant positions on the far right. You see it in the AFD in Germany, in the Sweden Democrats in my country, which will uh, apparently become a part of the government after the next election. 
uh, you see it in, in Brazil, you saw it with Trump and, and so on. And that's, that's a political force that we will have to uh, confront in the transition. It's not yeah. going to disappear. No. I mean, Trump is, is thankfully out of office, but the, the, the force as such the is names. alive and kicking. Yeah. yeah. And, but then you also have another uh, position that is still the minority one, broadly speaking, but it's very influential in some contexts and it's even the, the hegemonic one in France. And that is what we call green nationalism which says that the climate crisis is for real and the way to solve it is to close uh, the nation's borders and stop immigration and also start kicking people out. Yeah. Uh, and this is another very dangerous far-right tendency that we will mm. also have to confront in the, in the coming years. So the book is an attempt to understand the far-right, what it's done so far and what it, it's likely to do uh, as the climate crisis deepens. Also, the, the second part of the book it goes back deeper into history to see how uh, fossil fuels and racism have become deeply entangled and how the classical fascists love fossil fuel technologies and uh, try to understand uh -huh. why the far right is so uh, has become so um, uh, yeah aggressive in, in climate denial and fossil fuel chauvinism, if you like. Yeah, no, fascinating, mate. And I'll certainly be picking that up when it comes out. Um, it's scary. It's a scary future, but it could also be a beautiful future. So, yeah, you good, know, good. yeah as you say, it's either eco-socialism or barbarism, and we have to fight tooth and nail, don't we? Andreas, you've been a fantastic guest. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. Okay, so this is the part of the show that is dedicated to the fighters, the healers, and the conservatives of the world that are doing their bit for all of us. It's the shout-out. Andreas, who have you got for us this week? Well, my shout out goes to, perhaps not so surprisingly, Ende Gelände, the movement in Germany that is targeting the lignite mines, uh, some of the most horrendous sources of uh, climate crime that we have in Europe. And uh, the comrades in Ende Gelände are uh, still working on this. And uh, uh, I wish them all the best in getting back into full action mode uh, after the paralysis of the pandemic and my love to all of them um, who are doing the some 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 of the most important work that's been doing been done in in, in europe uh, yeah recently. brilliant and we'll we'll put some links as well so that people can learn more about the work that they do um, so thank you for that andrew who have you got this week pal uh so my shout out goes to low carbon homes it's like a uh, basically a retrofitting network across the uk that's been uh they kind of put on events and try and connect various uh, like councils and other people working in retrofitting together to make their work better. They've been showing our retrofitting getting project at their last, I think, four or five different events to kind of spread what we're doing about taking people who've been affected by the coronavirus and getting them into good green jobs in retrofitting homes. Um, so, yeah, shout out to them. They've been great. Yeah, excellent. That's a fantastic one, Andrew. Okay, my shout out this week goes to a campaign that we followed right from the beginning known as Trees Not Cars who uh, today, which is the 19th of the 2nd, um, won a landmark case against Manchester City Council to stop the council building a 440-space car park right next to a, a primary school in the heart of Manchester. Um, big congratulations to them. And, you know, we had them on, please listen to them on the show. We, I'll put up the, the link again for when they were on because they were fantastic for people who want to know more about it. But massive congratulations to them. That's not a win just for them. That's a win for the sitter. Exactly. Peter, who have you got this week, mate? Uh, my shout out is for Friends of Carrington Moss, led by Marge Panner, doing great work for the environment in the face of the competence of Trafford Council and the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework. <laughs> Keep up the good work, Marge. And the friends. Brilliant. You know, we're hopefully going to have them on, on the show in the future as well. Um, and we're working with them on an article about their campaign. So there's much more to come from them. Um, and we wish them all the best. Okay, so thank you to everyone that is listening. And remember, if you are helping the planet in any way, no matter how small, we love you, we appreciate you, and we hope you will join us again next week. Take care. Bye.